Hello, everybody. We made it. We're back. We're here. You made it to the end of the day. Uh, and from what I've seen from the comments from folks, it seems that things went pretty smoothly. We certainly had our hiccups, but that's okay. Um, I saw a lot of great, great comments about learnings and inspiration. Uh, and I'm just really glad that all of you were here to share with, uh, with this experience uh, today. Um, I have to give another big hearty thanks to our sponsors, our speakers, our mentors in lunchtime table topics, our volunteers, our conference uh, contributors, the board of directors, um, and all of you. Couldn't have done this without you. Uh, and right now I'm really honored to introduce you to our keynote speaker. But before I do that, a few things. I want you to all uh, make sure that you know that if you want to enter our raffle, uh, time is running out. I would encourage you to do this before the end of the conference. Uh, the link is in the stage chat. Um, we will be doing a drawing probably either later tonight or tomorrow, and we'll contact the winners. Uh, also, please do not forget to fill out your session surveys. The feedback is really important to our speakers take the time to go in, answer a few questions, and give them feedback so that they can improve um, their presentation skills, but also the presentations that they gave today. Now, without further ado, I'd like, you, I'd like to introduce you to our keynote speaker. Sakai Farai is an anthropologist clinging wistfully to the belief that research can save the world. Funded to provide anthropological understanding of the NYC startup ecosystem in the early 2000s, Sakai parlayed that experience into working with tech companies to translate user knowledge into actionable product direction. Her insights have start, uh, straightened out wayward roadmaps, roadmaps at your favorite tech companies. Her growing research venture studio, Humankind, is on a mission to include everyone in designing a world that meets their needs, and she means everyone. Everyone, please welcome Sakai Farai. Hey guys, hey Boston, what's up UXPA? What's up world? I'm so glad to be here with you. Um, really excited about the events that and sessions that have gone on through the day. Listen to Matt, um, provide feedback, join the raffle. I'm really lucky, so you wanna make sure that you get your name in there. Um, I'm here to call bullshit on empathy and user experience, and I want to do it with love. Um, thank you so much for being here with me. Shout out to Matt D and to Dan Berlin and the unmatched team at UXPA Boston that's been working really hard behind the scenes to bring this experience to us all. As Matt said, I'm Sakai Farai, and I'm an anthropologist that's been in tech since 2006. Like many of you, I've seen some shit, like some shit. And still, I believe that technology focused on the intention of being good is the most efficient vehicle for delivering goodness in this world. Similarly, I believe that user experience, a quality, disciplined UX practice, can accelerate that goodness further. I believe with every earner's part of me that what we do in UX is impactful, and that we can change the world. Um, we can change the world rapidly and by steep degrees. As UXers, I think we're under leveraged. I think we're overtaxed. And as a discipline, we've really barely begun to discover how to deploy UX to design worlds that we're excited to live in. Now, empathy is a trap. Um, and I think it's a trap that our business is happy to keep UXers in, while executive decisions that are made in other parts of the organization, like product, engineering, operations, and marketing, are driven not by empathy, but by growth. Growth at all costs. Growth at every cost. Growth on growth on growth. Can't stop, won't stop growing. Grow or die. The problem with empathy distilled through a growth-driven organization is that empathy doesn't scale. It simply won't scale. All of the empathy that we might be deploying and applying on the front end of the design process is inevitably filtered out by the growth-driven decision-making that happens on the back end. In most of the businesses we work in, there's no empathetic imperative. 
So when I say that there is a profound misapplication of empathy, I'm talking about the desire to limit empathy to the domain of the individual UX practitioner instead of it being the responsibility of the organization. So long as empathy remains the responsibility of the individual UXer, the individual designer or researcher, we'll be left with growth-driven decisions and not empathy-led ones. I think both empathy and growth are possible, um, but I think it's up to us as UXers to hold the business responsible for that empathy lead. Now, as UXers, we engage our users we distill our learnings into insights, we package them into opportunities, we deliver them to the business, and with little question, the business is gonna choose the shortest and quickest path to growth. So how can UX reasonably compete with growth drive, with, with the growth drive in a venture scale tech organization? Now, I don't think we can um, as things are today. I don't think that UXers as individuals and as a, as a practice can do the work we're meant to do while riding shotgun to growth. To get balance between the organizational charge to capture capital and the researcher's charge, the UXer's charge to marshal empathy, we need the business to put their empathy where their mouth is. We need empathy to be a mandate of the organization and not the individual. We know, as I've said, that individually performed empathy doesn't scale, and certainly not with the expedience that a tech company might scale. Because of this, UXers, researchers, designers spend a good deal of their time trying to convince their business partners to make the empathetic decision or to prioritize the most painful problem or to do those things that most directly attend to the human needs we're able to observe in our work. This is a waste of our time. It's a waste of our efforts and it's a waste of the, the work that we're really, really good at. If the business you work for doesn't in and of itself, without you in the room, have an empathetic imperative to drive empathetic decision making, I think we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing there? And who are we doing it for? Before I go further, I wanna stop and just acknowledge the condition of the world today. America and much of the world is quite literally collapsing under what I think is the weight of its full-throated insistence on heteropatriarchal white supremacy. Now, I think this is a fact that we have to look at and that we have to contend with in order to, to do the work that we're called to do as UXers. Whether you want the liberal outcome or the conservative outcome, whether you agree with the way that things are, are framed and named, what's true is that America hasn't significantly dealt with the conditions that shape the lives of Black Americans. This fact alone should mute any broad proclamation of the possibility of empathy within the context of your personal and political lives. It should inspire instead a sense of wonder and a sense of personal interrogation about while each of us hasn't done more to alleviate the conditions of white supremacy that shape the lives of millions of people. Now, as a person who's able to endure with incredible privilege amongst so much suffering, I want us all to think about the work we do and acknowledge not just in our personal and political lives, but in our professional lives, the tremendous lack of empathy. That lack of empathy shows up everywhere. Um, and when it comes to empathy, I think we're all failing terribly. And when it comes to empathy, I think we should all be a bit more humble. Now, because UXPA Boston has given me this platform, I'm gonna talk a little shit today. I'm gonna talk about technology. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about who I am and where I'm from. I'm gonna tell you a bit about the relationship between anthropology and, and, and research. Um, and then we're gonna get into the belly of the beast and look at how empathy is impossible when, when, when left to the domain of the individual. So I think tech is really fucking it up. I think they're fucking up democracy. I think tech is accelerating disinformation. Amazon cannibalizes small businesses on their platform. Facebook violates their own policies for ad spend. Twitter placates Nazis. Uber creates economic precarity with their gig economy. Airbnb has created tremendous housing shortages across the country. YouTube is radicalizing white supremacists. Grubhub has destabilized the, the restaurant industry. Yelp is is up to some, some craziness. Zoom tried to hold our privacy hostage during a pandemic. Tesla's calling plays on whether autopilot should run over the dog or the black person. 
volunteers surveilling us. 23andMe is sliding our DNA to the police. Next door is helping our neighbors criminalize us and, and so on. I think when I think about each of these companies, I can see that the problems that they solve are really complex. They are, um, but the harms are real and the accountability doesn't exist. Now, when I look around and see that every major tech company has been in the news with the new scandal, it's hard to look at the state of technology and say, yep, these technologies are the outputs of empathetic work. When we discover a new way that tech has caused preventable, foreseeable, um, sometimes really obscene harm, we call the engineers and we ask them, why did you build this? And we call the designers. And I think it's important that we, that we, that we bring the UXer in the room. You bring the empathetic, the empathetic researcher, the empathetic UXer, and you hold them to account for the harm of their technologies. I think we have to begin to ask ourselves, where did the empathy go? And I, I mean that in a literal sense. When we're doing our work, where does the empathy go? So my homestead in Zimbabwe is a small rural village. It's one of many homesteads that span over 45,000 acres of land. Our family lives in cooperation with neighboring homesteads and we're able to produce about 75% of what we consume. We're really proud of that um, because it allows us to rely heavily on a pretty sophisticated bartering economy. It's not perfect, but it works. Um, this homestead is about 100 miles away from the capital city, Harare. And to get to the city, you'll have to walk several miles, catch a few combis, and probably hitchhike for that last leg. We're surrounded by dirt roads made of red clay. And it's the kind of clay that will catch onto your fabric, rub off on every surface you encounter through the day. There's no running water there, so you walk a couple miles to get your daily water supply. There are no toilets, there's no electricity, no Wi-Fi, just a bunch of villagers doing villagey things. Now, anthropologists have taken a sustained interest in my specific homestead, in, in, the, in the village cultural traditions, um, because of a number of things, traces of royal heritage, bride price, our labola, our burial practices, some of our birthing traditions. Now, from time to time, outsiders would venture to the interior of the village to observe um, our family and our neighbors in the village, being villagey. Now, these outsiders were typically white and they would hang out on the periphery and ask that we tell them our secrets, only for them to, to, to take what we've shared and write a book about our lives. Now, I found that to be some of the most obnoxious work you can do. And when I think about it long enough, I, I resent it. I developed early in life a deep disgust for anthropologists. The result was that I became one. Now, early anthropologists believed that societies emerge in a savage state and evolved into a more civilized condition. Now, that process of becoming civilized isn't a natural process. Today, we recognize that process um, as, 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 a, as a process that occurs through exploitation and domination. Becoming civilized is a condition that occurs through intervention. So while anthropologists were exploiting the experience of their contacted communities and leaving them with little in return, user experience has a similar problem. Curiosity is the Trojan horse that anthropologists relied on to access those communities. But in UX, in UX, I think empathy can be a Trojan horse for exploitation. Now that's not a cynical perspective. I think that's really just facing the condition of UX in our work. There is no empathy in the capitalist production of technology, typically. Um, what we typically see is that there's observation, separation, exploitation, and domination. I think the industrial conditions of, of user experience extinguish the empathetic instinct, sometimes outright, but sometimes through the nature of our discipline, our pattern making, our frameworking, our filtering. One of, one of the things that I'd, I'd like to see us begin to contend with is this idea that we are all un uniquely and equally capable of empathy. I think what I found and what I've observed is that there's a tremendous lack of empathetic fitness. And when I say empathetic fitness, I mean, empathetic fitness is the condition of being ready 
and suitable for empathetic work. To be fit for empathetic work, you must be rested. And I, and I mean that literally, you must be well rested if you're going to engage in, in empathetic work. You must be supported. Um, you have to have what you need to do the work at hand. Empathetic fitness requires radical self-awareness, an ability to locate yourself, your biases and your limitations within the context of that work and, and broader uh, socio-political context. You must be meditative and mindful with the capacity to clear your head on demand. You must be explicitly anti-racist, critically politically aware, open-minded, courageous, tough, and you must absolutely be good, measurably so. Now to develop empathetic fitness, you have to do the work to develop those muscles. You have to be able to go from being clear-minded and empty-headed to being self-aware, to being self-centered, and again, to being absorbed in the other person's experience. And you have to be able to do this in a matter of moments. That requires effort. That requires sustained training. Empathy in user experience isn't a default condition. It's a readiness that we develop. It's a readiness that we train for, and we must continue to exercise to maintain that muscle. Now, I think specifically that there is an impossibility of empathy when it comes to us as individual UXers. This is something that I see in, in myself. This is something that I, I see in my work. I've done some of the best work of my career with an area of thought or experience of empathy. Um, and that's something that I want us to talk about more. Um, but but more, than, more than that, I want to talk about the lack of empathy in our environments, in the business organization. And I want to highlight for you that when you don't work in an empathetic environment, this obscures the possibility of empathy um, from an individual and structural perspective. So empathy has economic value, right? Within the context of our work, empathy has economic value. And that economic value is unevenly distributed. As UXers, our empathy seeking is an effort to quite literally exploit someone's experience, extract the value of that experience, disproportionately hand off that value to the profiteers. I think that's what it means to do this work. I think that's what it means to learn about people's lives for the purposes of profiteering. Now, I don't want you to feel badly about this. Every form of exploitation endeavors to hide itself. Every form of exploitation has a socially palatable cover, uh, a sympathetic or compassionate cover. For the colonizing anthropologists that visited my village, they called it curiosity. Cruel enslavers called it the divine order. Police call it protecting and serving. Capitalists call it competition. Engineers call it logic. Design calls it aesthetics. And I think UX calls it empathy. Now we can't do this work empathetically if we can't acknowledge how the corporate environments we work in trade in anti-empathetic values. Now the sooner we confront this, the sooner we can adapt our methodologies to treat this reality. Now I said it earlier and I wanna say it again that there is no empathy in capitalist production. I wanna talk a little bit about the power of symmetry. Now, I think UXers broadly have far too little organizational power to be able to drive the empathetic outcomes that we know are within reach. Now, when you don't have the authority to drive the business towards an empathetic end, you have to ask yourself, again, what are you there for? Like, what are the limitations um, of, of, of the empathy? How far can you go? Do you have the authority to put your business out of business? Can you, drive the can you drive the organization towards an empathetic end that might stall growth? When an environment doesn't have a commitment to the public good, there's just simply no room for, for the outcomes that we might look for. Now we know technology isn't neutral. We've, we've learned this every day. And every day technology is taking over more and more elements of our lives. Some tech companies are, are more powerful than governments. And I think without an outright affirmation for serving the interests of the public, for acting with empathy as a, as a qualifier for decision-making that is as strong as the impulse to grow, 
without this, without this ethic of empathy, you're going to continue to, to cause harm. And I think that as individual practitioners, we have to begin building the release valve for empathy. There's nowhere for empathy to go today. And I think that explains the condition of technology. Now, I think in many ways, empathy is actually a technology. And I think it's a technology that UXers use to bridge the gap, to bridge the gap between the observer and the observed. You know, empathy is not some sweet, soft experience. It's not a value, it's not a skill. I think that empathy within the context of our work is an extractive technology that can't function in an environment that relies on exploitation. I think further that empathy is always a transfer of power. Um, now, as, as UXers, you might see empathy as a transfer of power in the sense that you walk into a room or a space with participants and users and you have the questions and they have the answers. And at the end of your 60 minute encounter, you, you, you had the questions, right? You framed the conversation. You now have extracted the answers and the understanding from the users and they walk away with you know a $150 gift card. Um, and that way um, that participant has transferred their power to you. I think that our goal should be transferring power, not from the users to the business, but when you think about empathy as an institutional mandate, as an organizational responsibility, you can begin to see what's possible um, when you think about how a business might transfer power back to its users. When you think about empathy at an institutional level, you'll begin to see that it can be structural, that it's traceable. Empathy can be accountable. It's not something you can back into. You can't assign empathy to a department. You can't be human-centered in hindsight. Empathy has to be a top-down, culturally pervasive affair. So uh, the question that I, I deal with every, every, every day, you know, especially in this season of my, my career, is how can I make my work mean something? How can I make my, me, my work mean something more? So I think, again, that empathy for you or for me is, is a trap. And I think that saying that to you is, isn't a sermon of despair. I think it's a sermon of, of hope, depending on what you're willing to do in your UX practice. I think that there are knives and swords, machetes. I think there's all manner of weaponry to free UX from this trap of empathy. But it's up to us to pick up our tool and it's up to us to join the fight um, to hold our, our respective organizations accountable for being empathy led. I want to thank you guys so much for being here with me. Um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much, Sakai. Sorry for the delay there. That was uh, an amazing talk. Uh, we're all really grateful to have you here. Um, and I do have some questions that are coming in. Uh, so we'll get started with this one uh, from Diane. Are there resources that you can recommend to us that will aid us in our development of our own empathetic fitness? I'd like to share with my own team and our leadership teams. Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely. I think that there is a reading list that I have put together that just starts to think about how we can begin to locate ourselves in the work that we're doing. I will liaise with Matt to, to, to think about the, the best way of distributing um, some of those tools to you. I think what's most important is saying, wait a minute, are we doing empathy right? And developing the willingness to explore some of the other domains where you see empathy as a, as a more regular practice. And empathy is something that has been studied pretty heavily in the education space and in the counseling, in the counseling sphere. And there's a lot of tools that we can adopt and adapt from, from from those disciplines that I think can serve you at those. And uh, Sakai, if you have things that you want to send me, we can definitely make sure that uh, all the registrants get any links or books or whatever that you'd like to send to folks. So we'll make sure that that happens. Um, this is a question from Kirk. In what ways might a business transfer power back to its customers? Yeah, I mean, I hate to just stay in the, in the sort of capitalist exchange uh, framework, but that's a start. Like 
you can actually, I think what a business can do is they can do the work of figuring out what is the value of an insight? Like what is the actual value of that hour you spent with me? Now today we have ways of, of deciding how to, how to pay participants in research. And I think that the ways that we've developed so far are pretty shitty. And in a lot of ways, they are, they're not traced to the value to the business. So I think that there are a lot of really, really smart data scientists. There are a lot of really smart people who can expend some effort in figuring out what is the value of research to the organization. And the organization can then begin to compensate participants in research appropriately based on the value that they've contributed to, to the business rather than the value of their time. Uh, the next question I have here is from Jen. Uh, would you say that the end game of transferring power back to users is that UX professionals, particularly researchers, become unnecessary? Now you're speaking to my heart, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like how do you how can you scale some of these um, member based cooperative models that we know work? How can we make co designing like more of a practice? What are the opportunities for like customer experience, user experience, and like? Like, what are the ways that we can be more involved in, 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 in our world making technologies? I think there's always going to be a place for the, the, the professional practice of user experience. So I am not concerned that we're, we're going to be out of work, right? Because there's someone that needs to be responsible for applying discipline and shape to, to any work that might happen. But what I think is absolutely true is that there's more room for the users at the table at the decision-making table, not just the information-seeking table. Um, and I think that we have to begin to develop the models and practices that lubricate that. Okay, our next question here is from Lou. Does the word empathy itself create an implied social separation? When I hear words like empathy or sympathy, I feel like there's an implied counterpoint echo for the other, uh, signing like a uh, strange, uh, singing like a strange whisper in there. I tend to like compassion, but maybe that's mere semantics too. What's the real word or words we can use to empower each other, advocate for accountability, drive equity, deepen our mutual respect through what we do as researchers and designers? That's, that's a lot. That was a really poetic question. Thank you for that. And I think this is something that I struggle with all of the time, right? I think that I think that when we think about the, the origins of the term empathy, empathy literally um, in its original um, construction meant the emotions that you project onto art or an inanimate object. And then um, around World War II, a brilliant social psychologist began doing some research and sort of re, re, reworked the idea of empathy such that it was about um, your ability not to project, but to observe and engage the authentic experience of another person. And I think it's interesting that when we're failing at empathy, a lot of time it's because we're doing what empathy originally described, which is, which is projecting. So I don't think I'm going to get to an answer to your question, but what I do want to say about the way that we use the term empathy, what I think every definition of empathy is missing is that is accuracy, right? So empathy is not just about the experience or observation of another person's feelings or experience. It's, it's about the accurate um the accurate experience. And one thing that we can do as UXers is begin to reflect back to our participants, what we're hearing from them, how we're using what we've heard from them um, so that we can make sure that we're getting to a place of accuracy. I think that's something that you can do in a transactional moment. I think that's something that you can do over time with the way that you develop your UX practice. But I think making sure that we think about the accuracy of our empathetic experience is something that we can all do better with. I have a, a similar question here, I guess, from Michelle. Do you see a difference between empathy and compassion? I do. I think that um, I, I think that compassion is getting us closer to an action, um, and I think that empathy is more about the observation, acknowledgement, and experience of of another person's experience. Uh, I have a question here from Katina that says, uh, stakeholders tend to focus on ROI. Um, do you have any resources that we can reference to support empathy fitness mindset at our organization, similar to, to what we were talking about before? Yeah, um, so I would say just empathy fitness as a concept is something that is 
in flight, new in development. Um, but I, I think absolutely that there are some resources that I can provide to Matt that help us think about what is the value of you being better at this effort at empathy? Um, and how can you make that effort meaningful from a, a, an ROI perspective? But again, anytime that anybody's talking to you about ROI, I encourage us always to interrogate um, grounding any any conversation within that within that frame. Uh, Marco had a question here. Acknowledging that true empathy is counter to the capitalist production process, what do you think of organizations that try to make the case for empathy by putting it in business terms? Are there better ways to make the case for empathy that don't rely on putting it into capitalistic terms and gains? I think we see a really good, I, see, I think we see practitioners do a really good job of this in the medical field, in the educational field, where the experience of empathy in and of itself is satisfying and end. And so I think that that is our, that is our role to make sure that we are creating empathy as an end in and of itself. And I think that there is a high ROI in, in empathy. And I think that we can even get that to a quantitative point. I think we can actually measure the value of empathy, but I think it requires a lot of really, really smart disciplined thinking um, inside of the organization. Uh, Amelia asks, what are ways UX practitioners can hold the business accountable to empathetic practices when we are in positions of little to no power in the organization? Yeah, and let's talk about that. You know, one of my fantasies, is it a fantasy? One of my objectives is to, is to make sure that we're seeing UXers ascend to um, the CEO position. And I think one of the things that we have to start doing to tackle this power disparity is make sure that our managers are engineering a path towards the C-suite for us. Um, so there's that. The other part of your of your um, question, Matt, can you give it back to me? I got I got excited a little bit. No, it's fine. What are ways UX practitioners can hold the business accountable to empathetic practices when we are in positions of little to no power in the organization? Yeah. So I think what we can do, what UX does really great, which is observe, measure, surface, and tell the story. And so what I'd like to see. Um, from from practitioners who are trying to hold their organization accountable is for them to begin telling the story of how decisions are made, right? Like we all know how those trade-off conversations go. Just begin documenting the trade-offs that we made and the journey of the decision. And I think that this is work, if you're in a large enough organization, that's this is the work of, of you know, someone is dedicated to, to this work. Um, in smaller organizations, then track your projects and make sure that you're surfacing like, look, these are the ten decisions that we've made, right? And the, 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 these are the these are the, the the lenses through which we we evaluated the right thing to do, um, and just begin to surface for the organization how they are making decisions. I think another thing that we can begin to do is just make sure that we're thinking of our other business units when we're talking about empathy. So how might a marketing team um, make use of an empathetic decision-making framework? Do they have those tools available to them? How can UX support marketing in applying an empathy-led lens to how they make decisions? And I think some of the work that we do within UX, we need to begin to apply within some of the work that we see on our growth teams and our operations teams so that we're beginning to develop a robust framework, a robust library of decision-making tools that other organizations organizations can deploy outside of product. And personally, this is a question for me now that kind of spins off on this. Um, one of the ideas that I always thought was important was putting people who have this UX knowledge and this power to think about things in this way and putting them in other types of positions, product management, marketing, like you said, other places. Is that is that a pathway to, to doing this type of work as well? I think absolutely. I mean, I think that you know, when I say that empathy is a trap, I really think that for UX, it's a prison, right? And like, there's like the empathy, like, those are the empathy folks, like, and it's some soft, subtle work that we do off in like our little empathy jail. But no, I think that like, we need to begin to expand our reach, our thinking, our discipline, not just product facing, but organizationally. And so I would love to see um, again, our managers, our leaders get really disciplined about how we might take what we're really good at and, and helping it in other, other, other parts of the organization. I have one more question here from Ed, uh, and it's how do you turn around a typical user interview for, say, a website for, for a furnishing retailer to give power to the user rather than allowing the retailer to continue to take advantage of the user? Yeah, so I think one thing is, you know, like, one of the things that we do as UXers is like we enter like 
tightly scoped realities, right? So like you're interviewing a participant within like, you've already made a hundred decisions. And now the way that you are engaging in that conversation with the participants is limited by your discussion guide and what you hope to learn. And it's very tactical. And I think that one of the things that we can do in the beginning of that engagement, just simply putting our research guide aside um, and being honest about like what we're trying to accomplish and having a more dialogic exchange. Um, and that just means like, telling the you you know we we handhold our, our our participants a lot and like we protect them from knowing the roughness of what we're going to do with what they share with us right but we i think uh, more often than not can just tell them like this is where we're trying to get and have a conversation with them that 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 follows their lead and if in that conversation they don't approach anything close to where you were looking then i think that in and of itself is a learning to take to the business like when we introduce this idea of like furniture retail, it never gets to where you guys are going. That says something. Well, where does that conversation flow? That means something. So I think just beginning to remember that in, in, in user experience, like this is not an academic discipline. This is an industrial practice. And so we don't have to be as neat about how we behave and conduct ourselves in our research spaces or in our design spaces, we can be a little rough and we can be a little messy and we should take advantage of that to make sure that we're pushing the business outside of the scope of the problem that they've, that they've, that they've developed. And I lied. I do have one more question. It got lost in the, in the scrolling chat uh, from Jessica. Are there any organizations that you feel are making inroads into empathy? Uh, for example, any success stories or role models that we should be looking at? Yeah, I actually, I specifically told Matt not to ask me this question. <laughs> I was I like, did Matt, it anyway. I was like, don't ask me for people who are doing it well because I cannot commit, you know? But I will say a lot of those organizations that I mentioned as like the bad guys earlier, right? Like a lot of, a lot of us, right, are, are, are really starting to think about, you know, being better. And so I think that I'm definitely not saying that. I think about an organization who has removed um, length of viewing from one of their metrics. I think even just sidelining, sidelining certain metrics is a step towards getting it right. Um, it's a step towards acknowledging that there are some well-being indexes or indices that we need to pay attention to. So let's stop optimizing for this and instead optimize for, for something that's more appropriate. I think when we see a, a large organization like YouTube, Google say we no longer care about watch time, certainly that's something that they've been able to do off the, off the back of the growth that they gained through less legitimate ways. But I think that is an example of something that an early organization can do, a smaller organization can do. Um, I think also that I've started having conversations with a lot of financial technology companies and it's and I it's it's strange that it's 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 in that realm, but it's almost exclusively, you know, people from Robin Hood and, and Dave who have reached out and said, well, how can I, how can I help like do better? And one of the things that I all encourage people to do is like when they think about who they're, you know, one of the ways that like something really big and hard to solve in our practice, one of the ways, like, like white supremacy, right? Like that's big, nobody gets to solve that. But one of the things that we have to ask ourselves as UXers is like, what are we doing that perpetuates white supremacy? And for us, it's really obvious. Like most of the research we do is with able-bodied white people, right? Like. We're literally designing the world for white people to the exclusion of a bunch of other people. And so one of the things we can do is just stop doing that. So I've heard um, in the financial tech space that there are a lot of commitments to just, you know, deprioritizing the presence of like able-bodied white men. And that's something that we can all do. We don't need permission to do that, right? We can just go for saturation of, of less marginal, of, of go for saturation of marginalized groups as opposed to representation because we're well past the point of being able to be like, we had 13% participation of, you know, um, disabled participants. It's like, that's not impressive. Like I'd like to see us doing research where everybody in the room has an accessibility challenge, right? Because people who are disabled are still people, right? So you get the benefit of them being people and the benefit of designing a world that prioritizes their needs, right? You could do research that's not like for a minority product with, all Asian Americans, right? They're still people. Um, and so you get the benefit of, again, like the people and prioritizing a, a, 
a non-white experience. So I, I, I'm, I'm beginning to be encouraged by researchers who are in their practice, who are not asking for permission to design worlds for people whose voices aren't heard. So I, I wanna encourage us to continue to break the rules, you know, and don't ask for permission to do it. Just do it and let them tell you that you can't. Sakai, thank you so much. Uh, we, we're pretty much at time. There were a, a few remaining questions, so I'll ask you uh, how much more we should do uh, or if people should reach out to you and ask them directly, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, I'd like to take another question, but for sure, find me on Twitter or LinkedIn at Sakai Farai. Um, and I, I'm, I am thinking through these things in my practice. I'd love to hear from you. Um, love to start to think about how we get through the hard part of this work. So I'll ask this, this final question from Rex. Um, you characterized empathy as a technology, but also as an end in itself. The former suggests that it could be used for good or ill to empower users or manipulate them. Empathy as an end itself suggests a more inherently positive spin. Doesn't sincere user advocacy suggest a positive use of empathy and potential disruption of existing power relationships? Ooh, Rex, that is a good question. I think it's spicy. I don't think empathy as an outcome itself suggest um, a positive outcome because the reality is that uh, uh, an easily sort of defined positive outcome. I think that empathy as an outcome is really just about being responsive to the experiences of the, the people you're designing for and the people that you, you care about. And I think that sometimes that doesn't necessarily mean that like you, like it's a, it's a happy or joyful thing. Um, I think I also have to think about that more, but I, I think what I do want to close in saying about empathy is that like right now, when we think about empathy in UX, we, we problematized it, right? Like we're never being empathetic really with people when it comes to like their happy experiences or their joyful experience, right? You don't hear a lot of us framing empathy within like this sort of like celebratory experience. And I think it's because largely we've problematized um, right, we're solving problems in an industrial context. And so I think that empathy is a technology. I think the ends of empathy can be positive or good. I think it's why it's important for, for those who are empathetically fit to be measurably good. I think that there has to be a saturation of good people in this work. And I know people don't like terms like good. I believe in good people. And um, I think that like this is this is our discipline, right? Like we own this shit, and so I think that um, good outcomes come not because of empathy as a technology, but because of the people in the room. Like when I'm in the room, it means something that Sakai was there, and um, I think that should be the case when you're in the room as too, when you're in the room as well, Rex. And this is the part I miss of having a live in person conference. I'd like everyone to please thank and give it up for Sakai for a wonderful talk that gave us plenty to think about. Thank you so much. I, you know, I, oh, uproarious applause. <laughs> I'll pretend I hear it, yay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt, for, for, for facilitating and um, moderating this conversation and having me. Thank Absolutely. you all. I Absolutely. hope to hear from you all. Um, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, now, don't go away, everyone else. Uh, because there's something that's coming next. And that is the much sought after networking piece of our event. Uh, and what that entails is you getting together with everyone in this conference. Um, there are a few ways to do it. You can chat in the chat. You can do direct messages. You can use Slack. You can use the speed networking feature on the uh, left-hand panel. But one thing we're gonna do now is we're gonna open up the ability for everyone to create sessions. I'm going to put up a slide that shows you how to do that. Basically, you can run your own session, invite whoever you'd like, people can come and go as they please, uh, and, and you can just have a chat like you're, like you're in a standard Zoom session. I encourage you all to bring your own beverage uh, or pet. Actually, hold on a second, you're gonna wanna see this. I brought my own pet. This is Gilmore. He says hi. He says thank you so much for coming and participating with us today. He's a little tired, but oh yes, good boy. So thank you so much for coming to UXPA Boston 2020, our first all, vir all virtual event. We hope to see you next year. Not sure what it's going to be like, but 
it might be a fun time regardless. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening.